Hello, everyone, and welcome to the She Shoots podcast, Women Empowering Women in the Shooting Community, Season 3, Episode 26. Terry Bryan, Chief Firearms Officer, covering the theme of professional slash career. My name is Regina Ruiz Ordonez, and I'm from the Canadian University Shooting Federation. And joining me today, as always, are Denise Tomlin and Casey Gavinchop from Lady Guns, and Kelly Melanson from Maple Sweet Project, Sunfire Radio, and CCFR Women's Program. I would like to start by thanking our sponsors, uh, Cabela's Canada Outdoor Fund, positively shaping the future of the outdoors. Every cent donated by writing in up a check towards helping Canadian organizations just like ours. Savage, Savage Arms, home to the Steven single shot rifles and shotguns. Bread, a family owned and operated since 1526. Vortex, the best in optics, and Canada First Ammo. If you have any questions or comments throughout the show, make sure to leave them in the chat box below. Doing so will automatically enter you in today's giveaways. Today we have a She Shoots t shirt and a Canada First Ammo prize pack. So that's it for me. Off to Deneen and Kelly. Thank you very much, Rahina, and welcome everybody to this uh, wonderful episode of She Shoots. We're very excited to have an amazing guest tonight. I have the honor and the privilege of introducing you, Terry. So I'm going to jump into your bio, and then Kelly and I are going to ask you a bunch of questions. So okay. without further ado, Dr. Terry Bryant was a member of the Alberta Firearms Advisory Committee. She served as the Secretary of the Alberta Arms and Cartridge Collectors Association for the past 16 years and is the president of the Military Collectors Club of Canada. Bryant was an associate professor with the Haskane School of Business at the University of Calgary on national and inter international business. As chief firearms officer, Bryant demonstrates that public safety and a flourishing firearms community are mutually complementary goals. She will ensure that we preserve for future generations a firearms heritage that reflects Alberta's values of safety, responsibility, and respect for individual rights. A major part of CFO Bryant's role is to help bond Alberta's law-abiding firearms community together. Bryant has a strong presence in Alberta, connecting with stakeholders across the province to explain how the office advocates for law-abiding firearms, owners, and the focus on safety. So welcome tonight, Dr. Bryant. Thank you, it's great to be here. It's, oh. can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear Kelly. you. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Well, we had a little bit of problems with the me buffering um, prior to the show starting. So if you can't hear me, well, then just mm -hmm. kick me off and Deneen will take over. <laughs> <laughs> I can hear you now. Can you hear me now? Yeah. No, you're good. Yeah. You're good. Yeah. So we were talking before we went live and I was uh, saying to, to Terry how uh, ex she's a really whoa, experienced whoa, whoa. podcaster. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're really actually quite quite excited to have uh, Terry on the show tonight. And I'm going to wait for her just a second, just in case. I think she's come unplugged. Can you hear uh, me now, Terry? Some, <laughs> uh, now I can hear you. Somehow, somehow my little gizmo here got jammed somewhere and got reset to zero for volume. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> it sounds like your, giz your gizmo's reset and we're good to go. Yeah. Okay. So that just shows how experienced you are as a podcaster, because it happens to us all the time as That's well. Right. That's <laughs> right. So one of the things that people want to know about you is they want to know about you. Um, tell us a little bit how you grew up. Were you were you born and bred in Alberta, or did you are you a transplant to there? Uh, well, um, uh, please forgive me for this, but um, uh, I'm not originally from Alberta. I'm an Albertan by choice. There you so, go. Right? Um, so I was born in Ontario. Uh, we, Because of my father's job, we moved very, very frequently. I went to nine schools in my first nine years of school. Wow. What, I, what I call my hometown is Aurelia, Ontario, where I went to okay. high school, because it's the only t place I lived for more than a year and a half. Um, and then for my education, part of it I did on in Ontario, part of it I did in BC. And then I went back to... Um, went back to Toronto, lived in downtown Toronto for a while, and went back to, to BC to complete my education, and then ended up in Alberta. I moved here in July of 1990, so I've now lived over half my life, the better half, in Alberta. Wonderful. It's You're an Albertan by choice. Uh, it's yes. a wonderful choice. I mm -hmm. love it. 
I love it. And and what I love about that, uh, Terry, is you've got an interesting perspective from across mm -hmm. multiple provinces. Uh, mm -hmm. And I would expect that uh, you have an understanding of the firearms industry across all those provinces as well. Yeah, so, now, Well, one of the things that, um, you know, sometimes people think of Alberta as an outlier, but actually, you know, uh, if you look at the majority of Canada outside of a couple of metropolitan areas, uh, the way we do things in Alberta, the way we think in Alberta uh, is pretty widespread. It's not yeah. um, it's it's not really a matter of being an outlier. It's a matter of being probably more representative, uh, at least in terms of percentage of our geography. You're right. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about you growing up. I do know that you uh, were introduced to guns relatively young, were you not? Yes. So um, my uh, father's father was an avid uh, target shooter and hunter. Um, I still have um, a picture of him um, from probably taken in the early 1950s at an indoor range. And I display that in all, whenever I'm at a gun show, I always have that there. People can see that I'm a multi-generational. Wow. Um, and uh, I never met my great grandfather. I understand he had guns too, but I can't, I don't know much about him. Um, my father was an avid target shooter. He was a hunter when he was younger, um, and he was also a collector. And so uh, mostly what I did with my memories of things that I did with my dad mostly involved going to the range and going to gun shows. Um, and that was kind of a different world back then. You know, I mean, a, a typical range was just like you went to a gravel pit that mm -hmm. happened Belong to to um, uh, a gun club, and uh, to show you how long ago this was, uh, when I when we went to gun shows, when you walked in, you couldn't see the far side of the of the hall for all the blue cigarette smoke. Oh my goodness! <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while. Oh my goodness! Yeah, so so that was quite a while. I still have my junior membership in the Ontario Arms Collectors from 1972. Wow. So, um, you know, it's, if this is, this is my community, these are my people, yeah. this is, uh, where I feel at home. These are the people who've always made me feel at home. Um, and so it's my great pleasure and honor to now be in a position where I can attempt to, uh, give voice to their concerns and help to defend them against unwarranted attacks. Oh, we love that about you, Terry. Yeah. And and, and I, I love that uh, your comment was that you grew up at gun shows and gun ranges, because every time I see you in person, you're at a gun show or at a gun range. So things have stayed the same. <laughs> yeah. Well, if it if it works, if it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That's right. That's right. <laughs> That's right. So, so what about your career path? Uh, let's talk a little bit about that and how you ended up where you are today. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, when I went back to, I mentioned having gone back to Toronto after um, I, I got an undergraduate degree in Ontario. Okay. Uh, and then I went to UBC to get my MBA. After that, I went back, I worked in the Bank of Nova Scotia in international trade finance in downtown Toronto for four years. Then I went back and got my doctorate. And then I came to the University of Calgary and taught there for 25 years and uh, full time. And then on and off a bit for another five years until I ended up with this job. And and believe me, I have no time for another career on on top of what I'm doing now. Um, so I kind of view, I'm very, very fortunate in many ways uh, with this job. One of those ways is that uh, this job kind of allows me to uh, exercise all of the uh, skills and experiences that I have developed over mm -hmm. that time period, ranging from uh, managerial skills to, um, you know, strategic planning to public speaking to, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, my French and so on and so forth. So uh, all kinds of things that uh, along the way, I wasn't really thinking I mean, if you'd asked me a year before I got this job, will you, uh, what do you think you'll be doing in 2021? The idea of me being chief firearms officer was like the furthest thing that I could ever have imagined. I was not even, 
uh, on the radar, but here I am. Well, you have a lot of experience and background in it because I do know um, when we did your biography or when we read your biography, so Mm -hmm. you were the, um, so let's talk about a little bit about it. So the Alberta Mm -hmm. Firearms Advisory Committee, is that kind of like what was happening with um, when we had the Firearms Advisory Committee in Ottawa as well, or is this a no? no uh, what, what was what something that was. different? I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit murky on okay. some of that his, some of that pre me history. Okay, uh, but uh, the there was something called the Fair Deal Panel in Alberta. Okay. Uh, which was an attempt to figure out ways to develop uh, a more mutually satisfactory relationship with Ottawa and the rest of Canada. And one of the recommendations they did, uh, they provided, I believe, was to set up an Alberta Firearms Advisory Committee to study the question of whether the province of Alberta should uh, opt in to administering the Canadian Firearms Program in Alberta itself. So when... So when the Canadian, when when the Firearms Act was passed uh, back in the 90s, uh, provinces had the option. They could either choose to opt in and administer the Canadian firearms program themselves, in which case they would appoint the chief firearms officer for the province and uh, all the employees would be provincial employees, or they could opt out and... um, then the federal government would appoint the chief firearms officer and the employees would be federal employees. Um, At the time, I think both Alberta and Saskatchewan Mm -hmm. were so viscerally opposed to the Firearms Act that they just didn't want to have anything to do with it. But eventually it became clear that um, it was probably better to have a seat at the table and, uh, have at least some role in this and i think Mm -hmm. that is uh was kind of the motivation for uh eventually pursuing the idea of uh having the province take over the uh administration of the program here in Mm -hmm. alberta okay what about the other what about the other positions that you again because you have a lot of experience so the Alberta Firearms Cartridge Collectors Association you were involved with that yeah so um for many years i was a secretary of the Alberta mm-hmm. Arms and Cartridge Collectors Association or as we ac- uh, call it by acronym the AACCA mm-hmm. um and so Uh, How that happened was kind of by accident. I attended an annual general meeting and it was kind of dissolving into chaos. And so I stood up and said, well, here, do this, do this, do this. And next thing you know, I was elected secretary. Um, And if you, if my advice to people, if they ever want to become active (laughs) in an organization, stand for secretary because it's a job no one wants because you actually have to do something. Um, you know, to become a director or something like that, you, you get a title and often you can kind of coast. Uh, but uh, if when you're the when you're the secretary, you actually have to do things. You have to come up with minutes and and uh, stuff like that. So uh, anyway, uh, I did that for 16 years. I had to step down. So just to be sure, uh, be clear on the tenses, uh, I had to. Uh, step down from that position when I took my current position because, okay. uh, you know, we are regulating their activities, so it wouldn't be appropriate for me to to have that uh, that role. The other uh, role that you mentioned, um, I was um, for for quite a long time. I had various roles in the Military Collectors Club of Canada, yep. uh, and for a while I was uh, president. And um, that didn't really entail as much conflict because the Military Collectors Club, it's mostly people who are collecting medals and other militaria uh, and only peripherally firearms. Mm -hmm. So, um, and of course, my collection, as as you're probably aware, is uh, focused not exclusively, but largely on uh, Japan and the Pacific War. So I have a lot of military, far more military, actually, flags, banners, documents, medals, gas masks, uh, canteens, mess kits, boots, you know, holsters, and so on. I want to come to your place and have a tour. I think we (laughs) we need to get to the opening of the military museum. That's what we need. Yeah. 
Well, that's that's the thing is so so um, I often describe my, my husband is is not a gun guy. My husband is a car guy, okay. and so uh, but he's also a model guy and a uh, and a um, uh, train guy uh, and a couple of other things as well, like model trains and so on. So uh, I I've described our house as a museum with a bed. <laughs> um, and, and and a couple of cats uh, because it, it is uh, we added on to the house to mm-hmm. create more room for uh, for uh, our stuff collections uh, yeah uh, yeah but but um you know they don't build things like they used to like it used to be if you added 350 square feet for yourself it would last a while but i found it just got real full real fast you know <laughs> and so um, um but i i do take some solace in the fact uh, although the house is always al- always seems to be a little bit over full um it's not hoarding if your stuff is cool. And That's so, true. Uh, and so, um, uh, you know, we do have a lot of stuff uh, when I do have people over, which I can't have people over very often because I'm not home very often. <laughs> but when I do have mm-hmm. people over, I delight in, in thinking of what's going to be of interest to them okay. and then pulling out things. So, for example, uh, you know, if people are interested in the role of women, then in my Japanese military stuff, I have a whole slew of things that are uh, for women's patriotic organizations. And so they have, uh, you know, medals and awards and things that uh, were created for uh, the women of the time. And some of them are quite beautifully, you know, uh, decorated with cloisonne and that sort of thing. So um, and if somebody wants to see guns, I can probably find one or two around here. Too. <laughs> I do have Amazing. a question about that. What is your favorite one? Um, well, people ask me that actually quite a lot. Mm-hmm. And it's hard to, because I have, I own guns for quite a few reasons. Mm-hmm. It's hard to say specifically because, I mean, for for example, for each discipline that I might be involved in, I would have a favorite gun. Uh, mm-hmm. Then also for collecting. So for collecting, for example, I have the, the first baby Nambu I got. I'm very partial wow. to. Um, and it's a very, very rare gun. There, mm-hmm. uh, there's only about four of them in Canada, I think, and I own two of them. Um and they only ever made 6,500. So that's kind of a favorite. For target shooting, uh, my favorite gun actually is one that I inherited from my father. Um, and it is a high standard supermatic citation military. So this is an old fashioned uh, bullseye target gun. Um, and back in that those days, when people shot bullseye, they would shoot usually uh, either a revolver or a 45 and a 22. And so if you were shooting a 45, uh, it'll be a Colt 1911. The range of guns was not quite as broad back then as it is now. Yeah. And so this gun actually has a grip that's very much like a Colt 1911. It was designed to facilitate people going back and forth. And anyway, I find that gun, gun very easy to shoot accurately, at least as accurately as I'm capable of doing. And... Um, I don't have a lot of time to do reloading right now. So the fact that it fires 22s is, is an added bonus. Wonderful. That, yeah. That sounds like quite a collection and you can hear the pride of ownership. And I, I love that yeah. about this community. We all have our niches of, uh, of areas of interest and that's pretty cool. Yeah. So, and, and, I, yeah, and I have guns that belong to my grandfather mm. as well as guns that belong to my father. So, you know, there is a, a sentimental attachment to some of those things as well. Mm-hmm. Of course, uh, I uh, I can appreciate that. I have some of those myself. So, why don't we uh, why don't we transition a little bit, uh, Kelly and Terry, over to the role okay. of CFO? And uh, and as much as I would love to talk about your collection and all of those things, uh, let's talk a little bit about why Alberta has a CFO and what that CFO role is responsible for uh, for the pro- province of Alberta, Vice Canada itself. Yeah. So um, if you'd asked me that question, it's a good thing you're asking me that question now, because after about two years, I'm starting to understand what it is. <laughs> um, when I took the job, I had absolutely no understanding of what it was going to entail. I had like a formal 
uh, understanding, oh, I'll be responsible for the administration of the Canadian Firearms Program in the province of Alberta. But what that would actually mean in practice, um, I had no idea. And so, um, and it's turned out to be both much bigger and much different than I had expected. Uh, I had thought that my role would be much more operational, that if I was working late, I'd be there with a big rubber stamp going approved, approved, <laughs> rejected, you know, this sort of thing. That's not what I do. Okay. Um, so the one area where I am directly uh, sort of operationally involved is because of the way the Firearms Act is structured, I have to personally uh, approve or reject or refuse or revoke um, all issues related to ranges and clubs. So, um, you know, every few years, the range has to be inspected. I have other people, I have a staff who go out and, and do those inspections, and then they provide me with the material on which to um, to um, reach a, a decision. And what we have uh, very much tried to do in the province of Alberta, and this is one of the reasons why uh, why I think uh, people have come to appreciate uh, our provincial um, takeover of the office uh, is we, you know, people want to have a safe place to shoot. We want to give them a safe place to shoot. So our goal is to facilitate compliance with the many uh, criteria that are necessary for the safe operation of a range. And our understanding of that has progressed a long ways since I was a kid when like literally you just went to a range. It was like you were just shooting into a, into the bluff in a, in a gravel pit. And uh, you know, the firing line, if there was one at all uh, was two posts with one long post across it. Um, you know, things are yeah. necessarily a bit more, more complicated now but that's one area where i'm directly operationally involved um, then a large part of my uh, role is uh, strategic so deciding what to put where to put our priorities and and that sort of thing um, that has been uh uh, that, that's a very sort of high level role. I'm very fortunate in that I have uh, a deputy and now some additional, um, you know, a managerial director and managerial level people who can assist me with uh, details in some of the areas that we have to deal with. Um, but uh, in terms of general strategic direction, are we going to oppose this? Are we going to favor this? Are we going to do that? Those are the kind of decisions that I uh, that I'm involved in. Um, and then uh, the the a very large part of my activity, much larger than I had foreseen in the past, and much larger than I think any other chief firearms officer in the province and possibly in history, has been the outreach that we do. So mm -hmm. virtually. Every weekend, I'm at uh, some kind of an event. Could be a gun show, could be a um, a shooting competition, could be a conference on safe communities. Um, you know, one way or another, I'm uh, somewhere talking to the public um, a great deal of the time, and uh, I've. I'm, I've become kind of a fixture there. I probably have spoken to a higher percentage of the license holders in Alberta than anyone could ever have imagined. Um, and I'm constantly uh, looking to expand that because we have, uh, there are places that for one reason or another, I hadn't been able to go to the show. So I was able to just go down to Milk River, which is a community of about 800 that had a gun show this past weekend. Uh, it's 10 miles north of the U.S. border. And uh, this weekend, by Friday, I will be in Grand Prairie, which for those mm -hmm. of you who know uh, Alberta, it's quite a ways north of there. Yes, it it's is. about, uh, from Milk River, I guess it's probably 10, 10 hours drive. Um and uh, it's seven hours from Calgary and about four or five hours from Edmonton. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm constantly trying to expand our, our geographical reach and also to reach new communities. We, we welcomed a new person 
uh, who's going to be our director of, of outreach, uh, who has a great deal of experience with um, working with First Nations and other Indigenous groups. And uh, that's an area that I would like to, us to do more in. Um, and so we are constantly looking to uh, ensure that all Albertans, whether they are uh, the people who were here before the arrival of uh, Europeans, or whether they are longtime Albertan ranchers, newcomers, men, women, um, you know, of whatever, uh, you know, uh, group they may identify with, that all of them uh, have access to the services that our office provides, and that all of them are able to uh, make informed decisions about uh, joining the firearms community and becoming responsible members of it. Thank you, Terry. I just want to put a pause on that for a moment. You and I were speaking around Christmas. You came to one of our CCFR Gunny Girl calendar signing events, and you shared with me the statistics of your 2023 travels. Do you recall the numbers you shared with me on, on distance traveled and appearances and people spoke to? Um, well, um, in, a, in about 18 months, I traveled 50,000 kilometers with me driving, probably wow. another 5,000 kilometers with one of my staff members driving. Um, and then uh, I also went to Ottawa twice uh, and attended one, uh, one out of country um, uh, trade event. And then um, basically virtually every weekend I was at an event. So around 50 a year. I would say that I'm because some there's an occasional weekend when there isn't something like over Christmas, but then there are other times. Sometimes I've managed to do two gun shows in a weekend. You know, there was um, uh, for those of you who this may sound um, uh, you not might not appreciate the distances, but if you're if you're in Alberta, then uh, I attended a one day show in Crow's Nest Pass, drove from there to Calgary, and then the next morning I did the show in oh, it was attended the second half of the show in Olds which is just north of Calgary, uh, maybe an hour north of Calgary. Right. So uh, I try to um, make sure that uh, people have access to me so that not because I'm a, a celebrity per se or something like that, but because uh, they want to know what's going on. And, um, and so uh to the extent that I can, occasionally there are matters that are too confidential for me to disclose, but to the extent that I can, I tell them exactly what we're doing, exactly where the, what my understanding of the lay of the land is um, federally. Um, you know, we've been very fortunate to have very, very strong support at provincial level from the premier to the ministers that I've served under, uh, mm -hmm. the cabinet, the caucus, everyone has been very supportive. Unfortunately, that's not the case with the federal government. Um, I do have very good relationships with a number of Alberta MPs, um, but, um, you know, people want to know. And yeah. uh, I feel it's my responsibility to help facilitate that, particularly in today's environment where reliable information can be difficult to get, there's no shortage of information. <laughs> um, <laughs> but whether that's misinformation or disinformation or real information uh, can sometimes be hard to, to tell. So I just want to say, nobody appointed me uh, the voice of Alberta, but on behalf of Albertan gun owners and those people interested in the firearms industry, I want to thank you when we started posting uh, that you were going to be our guest this evening, uh, I received a lot of uh, just comments on my social media pages saying, we are so fortunate. She's an amazing woman. She's a great representative. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, yeah, on behalf of anybody who was following, <laughs> I, I want you to know there was just a huge positive shout out for you uh, in general and for you coming on to the podcast tonight so well uh, thank you that's very yeah. that's very gratifying to hear and and you know i want people to know that i take that very seriously that the fact that people are looking to me um i feel a great sense of responsibility to do the very best i can not everything is within my control but um but I do the very best I can to ensure that people are well represented and 
Um, we may not win every battle, but I'm sure we'll win the war. And um, so I just do the best I can uh, in, every, in every way that um, I perceive there's an opportunity to do something. Mm -hmm. uh, outstanding. And we, and we thank you for that. So let's talk about uh, you being an influencer. Yeah. It, <laughs> is there, do you, do you influence firearms policy or legislation? Do you, uh, do you have a hand in uh, how that, that works? Or do you just get to be the voice of reason from Western Canada? <laughs> um, well, a little bit of all of the above. Okay. okay. So um, at the, at the positive and uh, within the province of Alberta, um, you know, my, my job level is um, I report directly to the Minister of Justice, okay? Um, and so I have, I also have a, some, uh, I kind of directly report to two people. I directly report to him on policy matters and for administrative matters, I report to someone in the, in the Ministry of of justice, uh, who's also very supportive of us, I would add. Um, so at the provincial level, um, I probably play somewhat the role of subject matter expert in, uh, in the province. And so when issues come up, uh, I think that I'm quite influential um, in shaping provincial policy. It's not my final decision. Uh, you know, obviously our, our minister, Minister of Justice Mickey Emery right now, or pr prior to him, Minister Tyler Shandro, or uh, before that, briefly, there was um, uh, Minister Sonia Savage, and before that, Minister Casey Madu. Um, so all of these people are the ones who sort of have the, the that I report to, but they would listen to me generally, because um although they had varying degrees of familiarity with the, the issue, uh, I'm the one who is sort of most directly involved. Uh, and if I have one, one uh, you know, really positive thing to say about the Alberta government uh, in this area is that they do want to listen to people who know what they're talking about. And so right. if I can convince them that I know what I'm talking about, then they will listen to me. And uh, so, for example, when we... We're working on the Alberta Firearms Act. Um, I played a significant role in working on that. Of course, we had to have lawyers to do the drafting and there were policy decisions to be made at a higher pay grade and so on. But I, I was quite, I would say, influential in that area. Then it's a whole different ballgame when you go to the federal government uh, because, you know, but you also have to differentiate that there is a, uh, when you say the federal government, there's a federal bureaucracy, okay? And mm -hmm. I don't mean that in the pejorative term, but I mean the federal official, you know, permanent civil service structure. And then there's the political level. Um, and even within the political level, of course, there are there's the Senate and there's the House of Commons and so on. Um, so I think that I have over over time, you know, at the in the bureaucratic level, I mean, I deal with the other chief firearms officers. I deal with the senior people in the uh, Canadian firearms program. Uh, I think at first they were a little bit scared uh, of me because they didn't know quite what this crazy redhead was who was coming from the wild west and uh, and and so on. But I think over time they've come to recognize that I am a voice of reason and that um, I come up with constructive ideas. Uh, mm -hmm. that uh, I try to be uh, conciliatory and recognize the uh, the situations of other chief firearms officers. Um, most chief firearms officers do not have the freedom of, uh, of maneuver that uh, I do or that my uh, colleague in uh, Saskatchewan does. Um, so, you know, we all have to work together and recognize that there are... Um, each of us has a different sphere uh, of okay. action. Um, then at the higher levels in the Canadian firearms program, um, beyond the other uh, chief firearms officers, I think I've also earned a degree of, of grudging respect that I'm not coming up with crazy ideas that, um, that everything that I do is 
uh, motivated by a desire to improve public safety. And um, even when I'm talking about things that improve service levels, improving service levels, which gets more buy-in from the community that's being regulated, that is Mm -hmm. the best way to achieve public safety. Uh, you know, it's this, it's a principle behind community policing. You know, if you want to reduce crime, you don't go in there and start swinging billy clubs around and breaking heads. You go in and you develop relationships with the community. And that's how you will, um, you know, in the policing world, get a, get a, a better result generally. Um, and so people have come to realize that, there is sort of a method to my madness that I might not be doing things exactly the way that they have been done in other places. But, uh, you know, I have had a receptive audience there. I've been allowed to do presentations at chief firearms officer conferences and people have expressed um, respect and sometimes even admiration for the way that we have approached some things. Um, At the political level, where we're talking about the people who uh, form legislative policy in uh, in the in our country, um, that's a little bit different situation because um, that's governed by different considerations than logic or rationality, Um, and so. there's a there's a large element uh, of like when I, when I would go if I go into a committee meeting, um, I generally know exactly how everybody's going to vote because I know their party affiliations and that's what they're there yeah. for. Okay, but even there, you know, you develop relationships with people so that they come to uh, understand and respect you, and so. Um, even people who ended up not voting the way that I would have liked them to vote understood where we were coming from. And um, so, you know, for example, in the Senate, they didn't make any amendments, but I think I won friends in the Senate so that if later we go back to the Senate, I'll have a relationship with those people that will help to help them to come to terms with coming to reaching a different decision and voting in a different way on on perhaps legislation that that might be more amenable to Alberta's interests. So mm-hmm. um, so there, it's also a matter of when you go before these committees, you are earning you're attempting to earn the respect of everyone there by means of uh, of the quality of your answers and uh, and how well prepared you are. And, you know, little things like being able to answer the Quebec delegates in uh, Quebec uh, members of the committee in French and things like that, uh, yeah. that earns you respect so that the next time it's a little easier for you. Okay. And so uh, it's a long-term game. You know, you don't, um, uh, you don't necessarily win every, every engagement, but over Mm -hmm. time uh, you develop the standing that's going to be necessary for us to effectively advance Alberta's interests. Thank you so much. So I do have one question on provincial CFOs. Uh, If you are all working together, uh, is there opportunity for a combined voice of, uh, Mm -hmm. from a provincial CFO level to, uh, to, uh, to work towards a federal position uh, where where there's some influence coming from the ground up. Um, well, that's a that's a very complicated question. Okay, um, because uh, as I alluded to before, chief firearms officers have different jobs. Uh, okay, so. Uh, there are now seven provincially appointed chief firearms officers mm-hmm. and three federally appointed ones. The federally appointed ones um, obviously must be circumspect uh, in criticizing federal yes. uh, initiatives. And then even amongst the seven who are provincial, two of them are serving police officers. So obviously the, they have 
a limited scope for okay. uh, taking policy positions. And uh, it's really only Saskatchewan and Alberta that have the explicit mandate to uh, discuss big picture policy items. But what we yeah. do do quite frequently, like we, every year we meet at least once, uh, now generally twice, um, for chief firearms officer conferences is that we work on the details of how we're going to administer things. And um, I think there was some, uh, there was some concern even amongst people who would never generally question policy, uh, big picture policy issues uh, at how, there hadn't been a great deal of thought in the last package of measures, last couple mm -hmm. of packages of measures about how that was going to affect the work of chief firearms offices. Not, mm -hmm. not like they'll do, you know, these are people, if when you're in the public service, then you do um, what the political masters say, but uh, sometimes it's not easy to figure out how you're going to do that given the resources that you have and the legal structures that are in place and so on. So uh, I think there is room for uh, chief firearms officers across the country and, and probably a desire by many of them to have more input at that level, mm -hmm. even amongst those who either are not allowed or do not feel it is appropriate for them to comment at a bigger picture policy level. Some of those changes or some of the policies that were implemented were done so without consultation of the CFOs in the provinces, specifically. Well, we certainly never got consult consulted. <laughs> <laughs> no, but there is the expectation that the staff that work for you or with mm -hmm. the, the public in those provinces um, are able to fill those roles or the responsibilities that they're putting on the CFO's office specific to whether it's a transfer ATT issuing or transfers or anything like that. We saw that with BLC 21. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, um, the, the good thing about time is there's lots of it and it's going to stretch out as far as we can see. Uh, yeah probably longer than I'm going to be around, probably longer than you're going to be around. And so that time gives us the opportunity to fix things. And there's certainly lots that needs to be fixed. That is a true point. So speaking of time, let's talk about, uh, let's talk a little bit about the future and where mm -hmm. we see firearms policy going mm -hmm. and what we can do as gun owners to support you as the CFO, the collective CFOs across mm -hmm. um, to, to ensure that our future is bright and that we uh, help father time uh, mm -hmm. set things in a correct measure <laughs> <laughs> set, set things uh, in in favor of uh, logic and common sense no anyway so what's the what's the future look like Tim? uh well if you, that's going to be up to us by the way i always thought it was mother time isn't it mother time fair enough <laughs> in, in the spirit of international women's day and month i think it is mother time Yes. So, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, what the future is is going to be like is going to be up to us. Uh, mm -hmm. It's going to be up to the people of Canada and it's going to be up to the firearms community. And um, so what the people of Canada decide at the ballot box in the next election, I think, will be quite um decisive in shaping the future of the firearms community and whether there will even be one uh, in Canada. And um, then the firearms community itself, though, I think, uh, has a very important role to play in that process. Uh, I've always been one who felt that, well, perhaps not always, but for in, in recent years, I've been one who felt that uh, you know, we really have to dig in and uh, participate uh, that people who want if people want change, it's not enough to sit back and carp about things. You need to get in there um, and get your hands dirty mm -hmm. and uh, and do a lot of work. 
Uh, and it's a lot easier to sit back and complain or to say, well, I don't really agree with any of these people. They're not pure enough or, or something like that. Um, well, you know, you're never going to find uh, people or movements that will be absolutely identical with every viewpoint that you have. If you're looking for some reason to disagree, you'll find one. Yeah. So uh, what you have to do is figure out what's the best of the realistic options and then throw every bit of energy and uh, ability that you have into trying to make that one come out on top. Uh, and so what I always say to people, um, and this is, you know, over time I get to people probably hear that hear me say the same things. But there's three things, okay? Uh, that was three fingers there. See, I don't, I don't know where the camera is. There we go. There's three <laughs> fingers. That was three fingers. Maybe I'll just just avoid the visual effects. But um, there's three things that people need to do. So the firearms community is always going to be a minority, and um, given social trends, urbanization, and so on. Um, we will probably always have a bit of the sort of Damocles hanging over our head. So we need to be mobilized all the time. And I mean by that politically mobilized. Okay. And so that consists of three things, join, donate, volunteer. So join organizations and political parties that support what you believe to be an appropriate approach to the firearms community. And uh, so that could be, uh, you know, there are uh, three major firearms advocacy groups in Canada. Uh, and there are also many others at the, um, you know, more specialized ones that uh, deal with uh, groups, university students, women, uh, different um ethnic groups within our society. Um, so on the one hand, there are those. Um, and uh, even more important, perhaps, though, is political organizations. And so uh, at both the federal and provincial level, uh, there mm -hmm. are uh, political organizations, some of which are favorable towards the firearms community and some less so. And so if you want the ones that are more favorable to uh, to come out on top, you need to join them. Um, but then joining isn't just enough because like when you join, a say you join a political party, it costs you like $10 or $15 or something. Well, that barely covers the cost of communicating with you. And similarly, if you join one of the like the big three advocacy groups, it'll cost maybe forty five dollars. But by the time they give you a gift and send you a magazine or something that eats up the forty five dollars, too. So people really need to donate. OK, uh, and so uh, that's a an, that's a difficult topic right now because yeah. i mean everybody's facing cost of living issues and you know um affordability concerns but it's when those concerns are pressing that you discover what's most important so someone once told me if you want to find out what is important to someone don't ask them look at their bank book and their calendar and where they are putting their time and their money that's what's yep. important to them. Exactly. And so my rule of thumb uh, is that every member of the firearms community should every year give to some combination of organizations or political parties at least the value of one typical firearm they would buy in a year. So if you are a person of modest means and you buy $300 guns, give $300 a year. If you're a rich person and you can afford those uh, those uh, twenty thousand dollar custom made guns, then uh, do that, and um, and then uh, also um, you need people need to volunteer, and there's an enormous amount of work to be done volunteering, so. Uh, Volunteering can be many different things. Yep. So, for example, when you are um, 
If you are volunteering for an organization, you might be manning a table or staffing, shall we say. Let's avoid the that term. We'll say staffing a table, okay? Um, and there have been shows recently that I've been at where one of the members came to me and said, yeah, we don't have a table here because we couldn't get anybody to staff it. You know, everybody is busy. I know this more than anyone because mm -hmm. of the hours that I work, okay? Um, but that's, again, how you, just, how you show what's important to you. What are you prepared to, to devote time to? So you could be staffing a table. Uh, you could be doing outreach, talking to people. Um, and, you know, once you get into this mindset, then, you know, you will become a salesperson because every time you meet one of your friends, you'll be talking about things and it'll give you an opportunity to sit down and explain to them about the firearms community. Um, it, you, you know, when you're, uh, when your relatives ask, well, what were you doing on the weekend? There's an opportunity to explain to people what you, what you were doing. Um, and I, I have people who've seen me on TV or on social media or something like that. And uh, I haven't seen them in 20 years. And they come up to me and say, oh, I saw you there. And, you know, maybe I get a chance. Occasionally, I get a chance to take one of them to the range. I don't get to the range myself much, but if I can, I'll take somebody to the range uh, or to a, a gun show, show them what the, the community is about. And, you know, that's all all part of the sort of missionary activity that we need to do. The, the, the other part that I think is really critical in that volunteering aspect of mobilization um, is working with political organizations. Hmm. All politicians have one thing in common. They want to get elected. Well, two things. They want to get elected and they want to get reelected. Yeah. Okay. To do that, the money that I alluded to before, that's an important thing. But they also need manpower, person power, yeah. staff, mm -hmm. uh, volunteers, particularly at election time. And so uh, when you are uh, – this is how you can really – leverage your influence okay in 2017 uh, after prime minister harper stepped down in my writing uh, there was a by-election and uh, i went into the campaign office of the candidate that i supported and i said i'd like to work for you and they pointed me to the corner and i put together 450 lawn signs that afternoon Three years later, I was the president of that constituency association, and mm -hmm. I was writing material for the member of parliament. Okay, so uh, this, if you put in the time, you will get yeah. the influence. Okay, because who are the who are these members of parliament or um, MLAs or MPPs, depending on, or I guess in, in Newfoundland, they call them MHAs, I discovered. Uh, how are these political representatives, you know, who do they listen to? Well, they listen to the people that are helping them to get elected. And so um, if you are a hardworking member of their uh, volunteer corps, and you have sensible, well-reasoned opinions. You don't come across like a, a belligerent uh, person, but someone who has reasonable uh, approaches. Um, you will get influence, okay? Mm -hmm. And that's what we need to do. And some people might say, well, oh, but my writing, there's, you know, there's no hope of electing someone here who would be favorable to us. Or on the other side, they might say, oh, but our writing is a, is a lock anyway, you know, they, we always vote uh, a certain way. Yep. Well, there are, in every area, there are marginal constituencies, okay? Um, we saw that in the last provincial election when there were many, many ridings that were settled by, in some cases, a handful or perhaps a few hundred votes. Um, and so in those ridings, the people who are safe candidates would often help to organize brigades, if you want to call them that, to help go and do door knocking or things like that in one of the neighboring ridings that wasn't so safe. And so there's a huge amount to do. And, uh, 
you know, we need, you need to keep some balance. You need to, to ensure that you look after yourself, that you look after your family and, and the little furry critters and, and, uh, and all of that as well. Um, but don't be as totally crazy as me. Um, but, <laughs> but, you know, there really is a lot of work to be done. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's an old saying, I'm fond of old sayings because I'm old, uh, mm-hmm. you know, many hands make light work. And so if we have a lot of people, I mean, I helped to run, uh, I was the uh, campaign office manager for the 20, in a 2019 federal election. I had 80 volunteers on my list, 80 for one riding. Okay. So that's a lot of people and they did, Mm -hmm. there's a job for everyone. If you're good with your hands, you can build signs. If you're good talking on the phone, you can work the phones. If you're good with a computer, you can help set up and maintain the computers. If you just like to get out in the fresh air, you can walk around and deliver campaign material. Uh, You know, there's literally something that everyone can do. And if everyone does something, we'll be able to make a big difference. Yeah. I, I think that's so amazing. I've been writing some notes. Um, I'm, I might even put this together in a post uh, after our mm-hmm. show tonight. But uh, I just want to recap because we've had people uh, posting questions. And and mm-hmm. uh, like I said, some earlier before the show started. And so I just want to recap. I love what you said. We as a gun community, as gun owners, as people concerned about the future of our sport, uh, we have to be mobilized all the time. And we have to yeah. join, donate, and volunteer. I love the call to action, Terry. I think that's fantastic. You've uh, you've made me think about looking at my bank book and my calendar. I know <laughs> I do a lot more volunteering than I do donating, so maybe I should mm-hmm. balance it out a little bit. Uh, and the other thing is working with politics and politicians. And uh, mm-hmm. and I think if all of us uh, were comfortable taking some of those politicians uh, or those people that are contributing time to other ridings, especially the marginal ones, take them out to the range, introduce them to uh, some of these fun activities in this community. Maybe we can influence uh, um, uh, or some reconsideration of the position of, of mm-hmm. the uh, firearms community. So yeah. I love it. Thank, thank you for the call to action. Yeah. yeah. And, and one, of the, one of the things that's, you know, very gratifying for me is that, I mean, people see me what, because they see me at events, they tend to th- think of me as an advocate for the firearms community. But the biggest part of my job is ensuring public safety. And these are two parts of the same thing, right? Like when yeah. I'm out there, I'm explaining to people, like somebody will come to me and they say, you know, if I, is, is this sufficient for safe storage? And I'll say, well, you know, it might meet might meet the definition in the law but is that really the best you can do you know we should always be thinking about the best we can do when i when i go out driving my goal is not just not to have an accident okay (laughs) not just not to commit vehicular homicide or something my goal is when i'm out driving and i i I don't probably don't always measure up but my goal is to be a courteous uh, you know, driver. member of the driving public mm-hmm. and uh, and to ensure that, you know, uh, that I stop when people want to go across the street and and uh, things like that. So um, this job gives me the ability to mesh these two things, because when I'm out there, I can be advancing the cause of public safety by talking to people. And uh, and I think if we are able to make realistic changes to our firearms regulatory system that will pay huge benefits in public safety because you know there's the old saw about if you're in a if you're if you want to get out of a hole the first thing to do is stop digging and so if we want to have more public safety the first thing to do is stop wasting money on things that don't work and so you know things like uh the idea of uh, buying up guns from people who have been paying attention to the law and safely storing them in a safe in their uh, for for four years so far, and it'll be five or more before before the the current amnesty extend uh, uh, expires. You know, what's the benefit of that? There isn't one. Okay, mm-hmm. so let's stop doing stupid things like that. I think everyone is coming to recognize that the federal government needs to gain better control of its spending, even those who have been at the helm 
uh, are, are recognizing that, perhaps belatedly and perhaps not enough, uh, but everybody recognizes that, that you know, um, taxpayer dollars come from taxpayers. They come from you and me. That money doesn't, isn't just spun out of nowhere. And mm -hmm. every dollar that you are wasting on some cockamamie idea is a dollar that isn't available to either leave in people's pockets so they can pay their rent and their groceries or pay for something that is actually uh, in great demand, like ensuring that uh, we have good health care and education and uh, public safety, uh, you know, that we look after the people who are less fortunate in society and things like that. So, um, you know, we need to uh, we, we need to have a, a reevaluation of uh, what it's worth doing. And I think a lot of the things that have been proposed or even enacted in recent years on the firearms file would not meet that test. No, I, I agree. I totally agree. Absolutely. So <laughs> I've just noticed we're at the top of the hour and uh, we know you're an incredibly busy woman. So I think what we need to do, we always have one question uh, that we like to end everything with. Uh, and, and that is with regards to women in the shooting sports. So mm -hmm. before we get to that question, um, mm -hmm. I want to I want to reserve the right to call you back because I think we have a lot more we could certainly talk about. So, I agree. I'd yes. love to. Excellent. Thank you, Terry. So Kelly, why don't you ask Terry the question we ask all of our beautiful guests everyone to wonderful. Help all, yeah, all, help all the, the women in the in the shooting community and uh, and the firearms uh, uh, sports. Sure. So, Terry, our question is, do you have any final words of wisdom for young women who are trying to get into the shooting sports or and just in general into the firearms um, industry or occupation? Um, well, uh, so that's that's actually kind of totally separate. Uh, well, yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, totally, totally separate uh, uh, things. As far as being part of the firearms community, uh, I would say, um, you know, if you look at the, the demographics of the firearms community, uh, I'll, I'll, it's not it's becoming more diverse, mm -hmm. but there are still a lot of people who. Um, fit the typical profile that you would think of, like, um, you know, uh, older rural male uh, people, but they would like to, uh, I think these people want to uh, see a more, uh, they want to see a vibrant firearms community, and they might not have the interpersonal skills to uh be a good mentor, obviously, but if people persist a little bit and can have a bit of a thick skin, uh, then they will, these people will um, come around, you know, like they, they want to see people. And if you see someone and they, they might not think you're serious at first, but you show that you're serious and yeah, okay, well, uh, you know, I guess I, I guess I could show her, you know, and, uh, and, her, and, and their language might not be exactly appropriate. They may refer to you as little lady or something yeah. like that, but um, nobody refers to me as little lady, unfortunately, as given my stature, but. Me neither. Um, <laughs> but, yeah but but um you know just don't be deterred okay um don't be deterred um and there there has been i think a lot of progress uh in terms of um you know like in our office for example uh our office is um has a lot of women in it. My deputy is a man, but then um, uh, two of the three directors at the next level down are women. Probably at least half of our staff are women, uh, and many of them are avid um, huntresses, uh, if I can feminize a word, <laughs> uh, and uh, at, or target shooters or, or other things. Um, so uh, don't be deterred by the fact that uh, you don't see people like you 
um, if you go in there and show them that you belong because you're serious about your uh, commitment to the sport, then you will earn respect and it'll be mm -hmm. that much easier for the next person, for the next woman who comes along. And if she does the same, then it'll be even easier for the one after that. Um, so uh, have a bit of a thick skin. Don't be deterred. And uh, I think we will make progress. I love that. Pave the yeah. way for the one behind you. I think that's exactly, fantastic, yeah. right? And as we continue to pave the way, the uh, the need for thick skin might not be quite as uh, much of a requirement. So, yeah, yeah. I and I believe it's in anything that we did talk about, whether it's through getting into the sport, whether it's a career or the industry within the firearms industry as well. Yeah, Absolutely. Well, I mean, that's how uh, people people have to understand that, you know, the world can be a bit of a rough and tumble place. And everybody didn't graduate from, I'm here probably dating myself, the Emily Post School of Courtesy or whatever, <laughs> uh, you know. Um, but I, I firmly believe that most people are good hearted. Yes. And, um, you know, sometimes there's a bit of a crust to get through. Um, but once you get below that crust, then um, the tenderness that I think is in everyone will come out. Well, I think we all... Uh... We all love the the sport and the pursuit of it. So we just have to get the, through the crusts and the curmudgeons and have a thick skin. I got it. Got it. That's, that, that resembles some of my experiences early days. So absolutely. Mm -hmm. So um, we're going to we're going to flip it back to Casey and Rahina for a couple of questions uh, we are over time. So we'll only ask a couple. Yeah. And then Rahina has to uh, certainly thank our sponsors. But but before uh, they do that, I, I want to thank you, uh, Terry, for everything you do for Alberta, for the firearms mm -hmm. community, uh, for women in shooting sports, and uh, and thank you very much for coming on and joining us tonight. Like I said, we'll we'll call on you again uh, later on in season three, and maybe we'll we'll get to yes, talk about some absolutely. of the policies or some of those things. So so yeah. thank you very much. It's my pleasure. I'm always happy to to contribute any way I can. Wonderful. Very, very inspiring. All right. Casey, have you got a couple of questions for us? I know we we had a lot, but maybe a couple. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So um, the first question that I've got is from Jamie uh, Lee, and she's been a, um, she's been somebody that we've interviewed on our show before. She puts on a bunch of ladies' days. So her first question was, would you come out to a ladies' day? Um, and she's got a second part. I'm just going to find it here. Uh, and it, her and her range is, day is, uh, yeah. It, how it's up far more. in advance? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, just you need to request. Yeah. So I not, o I not only uh, can do, but have. Uh, mm -hmm. And not only did I, I brought, uh, so there's a, a range uh, just west of Edmonton that uh, mm -hmm. had a ladies' day, was very successful. Mm -hmm. I think they had over 100 uh, ladies come out and uh, I brought several of my staff members, some of whom were experienced shooters and some not. Uh, and I also brought our assistant deputy minister who had never fired Wonderful. a gun before. Amazing. Well, I think that was the Chaz Ladies Range Day and Carrie's with yeah. us on the show tonight. And she said, we loved having you. So uh, yeah. shout out to them. And Jamie Lee's uh, Range Day is coming up this uh, summer and it will be in Fort McMurray. Well, I'm um, yeah, so I'm looking for Perhaps well, I need to get up to Fort Mac. I, I, unfortunately, twice, twice I was planning on being at a gun show there and didn't make it because other events intervened. But I'm hoping to make it there this year. And, uh, you know, I love every part of this province. One of the untold joys of this job is that I've got to see a lot more of it than I, than I ever had before. Wonderful. There you go. All right. Any that's, other questions? That's the best way to... Um... Uh, um, follow up with that question is how can people get in touch with you? Mm -hmm. Okay, so so the best the best way uh, is I'll uh, get your pen and paper handy or or your I guess do do young people use pens and paper still um, <laughs> or do you just <laughs> use directly into your phone? Um, yeah. So uh, our email is Alberta CFO. Alberta CFO 
at gov.ab.ca. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I have staff who go through that inbox every day. Sometimes we're right up to date and they're able to get it in a day. Sometimes it takes a couple of days, depending on, you know, the, the flow of work and, and so on. But uh, that that will get to me. And, um, you know, I have some sometimes I'm able to attend an event on the spur of the moment if my schedule is free. Um, and sometimes, you know, uh, a date is booked already. So um, I do uh, I, I do almost always work seven days a week. So wow. there's lots of room for um, for um, uh, there's 168 hours in a week. And so <laughs> there's there's lots of hours there that some of them's got to be free somewhere. Right. Wonderful. All right. Well, I hope we answered those few questions. We have a lot of positive comments and comments, statements, yeah. uh, and 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 a, a bunch of other women. Abby, I think Abby's down in the Lethbridge area. She said they want you down at their ladies' range day too. So we could fill up your calendar just with ladies' events. I think. <laughs> well, I look I look forward to that. I I enjoy uh, every aspect of that activity. I've got. I enjoy the people. I enjoy being out in the fresh air. I enjoy seeing other parts of the province. I enjoy helping new people, uh, especially women, to join the sport. And so um, I very much look forward to the day when um, when I have 365 of them. That's right. Well, <laughs> I, I heard you like shooting guns too, so maybe we'll set you up there, right? Yeah. Yes, yes. That's well, right. I do. Outstanding. Well, we also like our sponsors and I know Rahina has to do some thanking and yep. uh, a couple of things before we can close up tonight. So Rahina, how about over to you? Uh, thank you, but we're actually forgetting a very important part. We have two prizes to give out. Well, well right. How yeah, did we so forget about that? Let's do that. Casey, let's do some numbers and let's give out the uh, Shishi's t-shirt first. All right, so our first winner is going to be Mark LaFrance. Wonderful. Congratulations. And Facebook, so... Yep. So you don't have to worry about... We'll, we'll contact you through Facebook. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think Mark then, knows how to reach us. Yes, he does. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and then yeah. our second prize is a Canada First Ammo Prize Pack. So who won that one? And that is uh, Abby Slovak. Abby, yeah, Congratulations. Think, that was her question. That was the question we didn't get to, but I think um, I think Terry did a really good job of um, answering that. The before we three pronged approach. Read, so. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And I just messaged Abby today about something that went missing in the mail. So Abby, I will uh, I will hook up with you on this one as well. So um, awesome. Yeah. So thank you so much. Now, how about our sponsors? Yes, I can do that. Um, I'll just wrap up with a quick uh, uh, um, announcements, news. Sure, Don't why don't we do that? Like to use right now. Um, okay. So for the International Women's Day event in Calgary that was supposed to be uh, on March 8th, we actually had to, it had to be rescheduled due to unforeseen circumstances, unfortunately. So it's being rescheduled to March 21st. So if at first you couldn't attend, but you're able to attend on the 21st. Tomorrow, you will be able to sign up through the CUSF website for the event. Uh, we'll share it on social media so you're aware once it's available for you to sign up if you're interested in attending the uh, International Women's Day event in Calgary. Other than that, I'll close up and thank our sponsors. So thank you again to Cabela's Canada Outdoor Fund, Savage Arms, Breda, Vortex, and Canada First Ammo. If you like today's episode, please leave us a like and follow us so you don't miss out on any of our episodes. You can watch us on YouTube and Facebook and listen to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and iHeartRadio. If you liked our message and would like to learn more about our programs, check out our websites at cusf.ca, ladyguns.ca, and maplesweetrifleman.com. To support us and get some additional perks, check out our membership programs. Thank you all for tuning to the She Shoots Podcast Season 3, Episode 26. Terry Bryan, Chief Firearms Officer. Make sure to join us on April 9th for the next episode of the She Shoots at our regular time, 5 p.m. PST, 6 p.m. MST, 8 p.m. EST. We know the drill.
plan <laughs> keep on an eye on our social media pages for the next episode announcements. Thank you, everyone, and have a good night. Thank you, everyone. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye now.